by defining them. And so there is a political gain, a political positive to controlling identity. But if we then begin to ask, how do you control identity, we begin to see the benefits of hate. I want to argue this can happen at two different levels. If we look at the prototypical example that is used always in Europe about hatred, it's going to be the Nazi example. The Nazi Holocaust, the murder of some six million Jewish people simply because they happened to be Jewish. But why? Why did it happen? There weren't many Jews in Germany. They certainly didn't constitute a threat. Most of them were assimilated. And what's more, it was really hard to define who was Jewish. It's not something that's easy to do. And that's why you've got these absurdities of the Nazis going out with instruments measuring the size of noses and the like. I mean, it's laughable. Why? One of the best analyses I've come across by Michael Point that made the point that, look, Hitler, was trying to impose a very particular understanding and definition of Germanness based upon strict hierarchy, the Führer principle. And he needed to control that definition by demonizing and destroying anybody who contested it. Now, Jews became the prototypical community alien, those outside that national community. But if you couldn't define who was Jewish, then anybody who behaved in doubtful ways became Jewish-like, became a community alien, was in a position to suffer the same fate as the Jews. So that by defining a demonic outgroup, but not being able to say who was part of that outgroup, <coughs> that allows you to destroy anybody who deviates from your notion of how the group should behave. It has a profound political power, the use of the out-group, in terms of controlling your definition of the world. Let me use a second <coughs> example. And here I draw an example, probably with some uh, temerity. So I apologize if I've misunderstood. I'm learning about these things. Here again, there is a contested understanding of the idea of India. And as you know, there has been the rise of the Hindutva and of parties like the VHP. We've been doing, I should, when I say we, and one of the fruits of our collaboration has been the fact that already uh, some students have come to work with us, and one student um, has come to work with me for a PhD and has been analyzing the political posters of the VHP. And what you find in these posters time and time again is an out-group attacking the in-group, a threat to India. But the interesting thing is that the threat varies. Sometimes in these posters the threat might be Muslim. Sometimes it might be Christian. Sometimes it might be foreign or Arab. The out-group varies. But what is the commonality in all these posters is the notion that the government is colluding in this attack. <coughs> So what you see is that although the focus seems to be upon the out-group, Muslims are attacking us, the real message is, and the government is failing because it's not defending us. And therefore what the VHP is really doing is it's mounting an argument against its rivals. It's saying, we look after India, we will defend India against its enemies, but our rivals are not. So again, there's an advantage to constituting demonic out-groups because you can then discredit your rivals for authority by saying, and they are not looking after us. So, I want to argue that there are very good reasons why elites should want to mobilize hatred, why elites should want to demonize outgroups, why elites might want to talk in hateful and even genocidal terms. But why do people buy it? Why do people go along with it? What psychologically are the steps which engage people with this discourse of hate and make it a social power. And that's what I want to finish with, by looking at a number of steps by which that happens. And I want to argue that there are three steps. The first step is drawing the boundaries of the in -group. We might have intimacy with fellow members of our own group. We might love our fellow Indians. 
our fellow Scots, our fellow football fans, but who's included in that group? What are the boundaries? Let me use a stark contrast here, again drawn from the European example of the Holocaust. We all know about the evils of the Holocaust, but there are some good stories. Bulgaria was the only country occupied by the Axis where not a single Jewish person was deported to the death camps during the war because the population mobilized against it. And we analyzed the discourses of this mobilization, the discourses of this mobilization which saved the Jews. And what you find is that people don't even talk about Jews. They talk about fellow Bulgarians. They make the point that Jewish people are included in the in-group. So it's not that the Germans were attacking them, they were attacking us, so necessarily we resisted it. Talking about Jewish people, you will see that the word